Hi, I'm Paul Hopewell. I make all sorts of parts and components in my workshop and my videos show you how I get on. In this video I'm making further modifications to a 1950s Bond mini car steering head. This time I'm altering the worm drive bearings, adding a constant pressure device and cleaning up the worm and sector gears. This is where I got to at the end of my last Bond mini car steering video. Please bear with me on this for a couple of moments because before I get going it's best that I explain a few things first. These little cars are steered by using a worm and sector gearing system. The worm drive is directly connected to the steering wheel via a direct coupling. The worm gear in turn drives a sector gear back and forth to steer the car. However, over the years most of these components have worn and the stock of available spares has dwindled to almost none. Replacing the main steering bearings has improved things if you see the video modifying a Bond mini car steering. This means the steering is easier but the plate is still there because of the wear in the steering gear. After stripping the worm and sector down I found further issues. Issues that would, in my mind, create steering problems. Starting with the worm and worm casing, the casing supports the worm gear at both ends via a couple of small bearings. These bearings are open, non-adjustable, shallow seat bearings, and they, in turn, are sat on two tapered seats, presumably to allow some sort of adjustment. The problem is, the adjustable seats wear in a way that put more stress on these little bearings and as we can see here, can cause the worm to rub against the inside back of the worm casing. My plan is to get rid of these open tight bearings and fit sealed deep seat bearings. I'll machine both ends of the worm casing to become push fit bearing supports using short lengths of sleeving to pack out any of the missing material. After finding some thin wall tube to use as a sleeve, it was pressed into place and sawn off with a hacksaw. A little light dressing on the belt sander made it flush with the, the support body. You can just make out that the sleeving is quite short, 4mm in fact. Over to the lathe to set it up in the jaws with a DTI. First I roughed out the bore, then skimmed to size for a push fit to suit the new bearing. The same process was used on the other end, except that its shape meant that I had to use the four jaw chuck. This is the first time I've used this chuck in anger and uh, it's the very reason I made it. It's quickly fitted in place and it's just as quickly removed. What is more, I don't have to reset the three jaw chuck afterwards. Anyway, the bearing seat is soon machined to accept the replacement bearing. Both bearing seats have now been machined to allow a push fit. I can't assemble the worm without first addressing the worm gear faces. It's worth me mentioning at this point that I had one very badly damaged worm to do some destructive research on. After using an angle grinder on it, the hardness remained above 60 on the Rockwell scale. The same was true for the quadrant. But as for the half inch diameter by two and three quarter inch long section of the worm, this was softer along the last two inches of its length, presumably to remove the fracture potential from the steering wheel and coupling combination. What I'm going to do now is try very briefly to explain how I cleaned up the gear faces. For this purpose I will show you the quadrant again. After all, they do mesh together. And the quadrant is much easier to explain than the worm gear. And if I straighten out the gear teeth, we'll have a rack. <laughs> 
and look a little closer, the teeth, instead of having a profile like this, the central most worn teeth will have a profile like this. I'm planning to use a grinder to lightly recover the tooth profile by cutting deeper into the material with a 12dp profile. Then skim the top to maintain the overall tooth depth on both parts. After this is done, both the worm and sector will mesh together much better than before. Back to the worm gear. How on earth are you going to regrind a worm gear, especially with four starts on it, I hear you ask? Well, I'm going to use this. It's a tool I built quite some time ago to help me regrind the cutting edges of straight and twist fluted taps, as well as the faces of drill bits. As you can see here, I'm going to use it on the Clarkson tool cutter grinder, along with a few bits and bobs to adjust and secure everything to the correct angles. This is a part of an angle setting bracket I made ages ago. It'll happily take the weight and lock everything into place quite well. I know this because I've used it to do this job before. To hold these two plates in position, two slide brackets are fitted later. The sliding centre is mounted and set in place. Then the cutting blade is fitted. The edge of the blade is 1.9mm wide and the sides are feathered at 14 degrees each side. I'm using a cutting blade because most of the machining is to take material off the bottom of the tooth seat and very little off the sides. This worm cutting angle is set to around 24 degrees for the root of the teeth. There are different ones out there, of course, so there'll be different angles. A profile gauge and one edge of another spare quadrant was used to confirm the profile as close as possible. There's only a 13mm long section on the worm that's well worn. This means the rest of the gear has to be ground until the worn section almost cleans up leaving a witness in other words. See here that I've got two guides fitted. Each one is set to engage and disengage without jarring. Also having the two guides reduces the error that would be repeated along each tooth if there was only one guide. When one of the guides runs alongside the worn section, it is prevented from following it because the other guide is following a section that is not worn. The gear meshes quite well here now, using the relatively little worn section of another quadrant. The grinding angle is reduced to 18 degrees, just to polish near the tops of the teeth. This helps prevent the blade from distorting. The front part of the blade skims the back of one tooth and the back part of the blade skims the front of the adjacent tooth. As I'm as happy as I can be with the progress so far, I've got to sort out another issue. One of my own making in a way. When the worm gear is assembled, the gears need to move closer together to engage properly. But the old adjustment had only limited travel in the first place. So what I intend to do is tilt the worm tube over by half a degree or so. This will recover the lost adjustment and not affect the steering wheel position beyond 4 or 5 millimetres. I understand this is an acceptable adjustment. On the original steering head that I modified, I skimmed the aluminium castings seating in order to alter the angle. This time I plan to reface the bottom bearing support. After all, it's much cheaper to replace than the original casting. This side needs less than one millimetre removing and the other side must not be touched. My only choice was to use the lathe with the three jaw chuck fitted. Placing a 0.4 millimetre copper packer over the top of one jaw did the job of tipping the material over just enough. Once clamped and tapped well into the jaws, the cast iron material will be wonky and will have to be machined carefully so as not to dislodge the material. Using a high speed steel roughing tool did the trick nicely.
several passes were made to ensure that I didn't lose or damage the material. Now it's time to assemble the worm gear and bearing assembly. I used the press to get the bearings fully home. The white dot indicates a point on the worm that's 180 degrees from the original wear point. The end cap was screwed into place before assembling the remaining components. It doesn't really matter which way it's assembled though really. Now it's time to sort the quadrant. At first I thought it was a standard 54 tooth helix gear with a 2 inch bore and 3 flats flame cut off the bottom. Then I find it's nothing of the sort. After much deduction it's a flame cut shape. A shape where a 2 inch hole was machined in before the gears were cut using a milling machine and an index table combination. I confirmed this using two gears on a two inch bung and they produced a 54 and about a two thirds teeth gear. This is what left me to the conclusion that the index table was first offset by approximately 13 thou. The reason? Well, the makers realised that the middle section of this quadrant were wear at a rate far quicker than the extreme ends and attempted to allow for this. Probably what they perhaps didn't take into account is that a very high degree of wear happens on the gear representing the wear that occurs when a driver is constantly attempting to realign the steering against the very high friction loads of the old main bearing cup and bush system. But the end result is that adjusting the system used at the time was basically a jacking system that added to the problem. If the owner adjusted the play out of the steering to prevent any issues while in a straight line, the worm gear was over pressured by the nearby teeth that weren't so badly worn, and this would either lock the steering up or sprain the worm gear support. I'm sorry that was a bit long winded, but it had to be aired in the light of what I'm going to do next. My job now is to clean up the 54 tooth offset quadrant on the Clarkson cutter grinder using my indexing head. The smaller gear you see here is being used as nothing more than a big packing washer. Some of the cleaning is going to be more aggressive than in other parts, that's because I'm removing some less worn material either side of the worn central section to even up any imbalance. I spent quite some time setting up to ensure that the teeth were aligned correctly before I started cutting. I did find that the majority of the corrective grinding on the quadrant was mostly at the root of each tooth near the centre. I also mentioned earlier that each tooth flank had varying levels of cleaning to be done to remove most of the gear wear. All teeth had to be skimmed on the tops to maintain the overall tooth depth and tip width. Not to mention the fact that the quadrant was in need of a good clean up in the first place. Now I'm about to complete the final part of the whole process which is making an automatic adjusting device. You can see here the original method of adjusting the steering plate. But now I'm going to show you what I did to make one of these automatic adjusting units. Any machining that I do to the steering casting must of course not interfere with any of the original fixtures or fittings to allow the casting to be used again in its original state if or when required. But more importantly the new unit must be fail safe and it must be easy to fit and set up. To start with I skimmed the casting along the side nearest the old adjuster. Then I set about making an odd shaped T-piece from a block of aluminium or aluminium 
that was firstly rough sawn to shape. One part of the T piece was milled square then offered up to the casting to get an idea to the shape it needs to be for the next part. Clamping it to the main casting allowed me to complete the marking out for the next process. There's nothing really special about the angles here. The process is set only to get the push bolt as near to right angles to the base of the worm gear support tube. I used my universal milling vise to set the T-piece at the required angles, but also to enable me to get the remaining part of the T-piece to look like a block and not a badly made coffin. The T is then turned over to allow me to machine a relief on the bottom face with preventing the possibility of distortion or even breakage. Finally the top face is cleaned up before I fettle it. To be sure that I'm working on the same spot on the main casting, I ascribed a line as a reference point. These crosshairs mark the positions for the two 6.8mm holes. And here I'm just visually confirming that there aren't any issues before I start drilling any fixing holes. These are the two 6mm high tensile socket head screws that I'll use to hold the T-piece in place. The two holes will help mark the positions of the two M6 socket screws. I'll use a drill bit for this because I don't have a 6.8mm centre punch. But as I'm using it on aluminium I figure why not because I'm going to make a drill sharpener soon anyway. So long as I rotate the drill bit while I'm tapping it it should leave a fairly round mark in the casting. Drilling and tapping the casting was a standard task, except that the depth was deeper than usual. Mounting the T-block in place confirms the fit. For one final check. A point worth mentioning here is if the adjustment was to float freely, the gears will still remain engaged, but with a massive amount of play at the steering wheel. This is where I marked out for the stop bolt and spring positions, making sure that the centre of the bolt lines up with the mark left by the original jacking bolt. A few minutes on the pedestal drill sorted out the tapping hole size and the opening to accept the pressure spring. The pressure spring will sit fully inside this opening. It's the stop bolt that pushes the spring towards the worm tube base. The stop bolt consists of a long bolt that is just the right length to get the job done. The thread is being machined off to allow the pressure spring to fit over it down to a shoulder. The shoulder will in turn bear a washer that will again support the spring. The end of the stop bolt is later machined down to provide a 3mm spring compression. Its task when finished is to apply pressure to the side of the worm wheel tube to maintain a constant pressure between the worm and quadrant gears. The spring is quite a powerful spring and it leads the, the stop bolt by 3mm.
This spring overcomes the friction that's set up between a lubricated Teflon gasket and some very clever washers. The Teflon gasket isn't really a gasket, it's there to provide as little friction as possible between the casting and the worm gear tube base plate. It doesn't have to be accurately cut out, it just has to act as a very thin bearing. When the whole lot is finally assembled, a thin smear of red grease will be applied to both sides. Now it's time to assemble the whole unit. I first assembled the quadrant onto the steering head. The nuts I used are temporary ones that the owner will have to replace them. The stud is now fitted followed by the pivot bolt. They were both treated to a dollop of Loctite thread lock first. A locking knot was then tightened onto the back of the stud. After the Teflon gasket was lubricated and fitted, the worm tube assembly was sat in place taking care to align the white spot on the worm gear with the middle tooth on the quadrant. The worm tube is held in place by some very special springs. They look a bit like bronze coloured domed washers. But they are proper springs designed to hold two flat parts to each other while allowing under certain conditions the two flat plates to slip beneath. Like this casting and worm tube assembly. I'm fitting two of these springs, one over the pivot point and I'll set it to firm and the other one will sit on a flat washer and it too will be set. This will allow it to rotate within limits around the pivot but not lift off the Teflon base. When the T-piece and pressure spring is bolted on, all I have to do is adjust the stop bolt, then lock it in place. There are a few adjustments to be made so as not to over tighten anything. When it's all done it's very hard to turn the quadrant through the worm gear but it's quite the opposite turning the quadrant through the worm gear. The all important thing is that there is no backlash. That's all for now. Thanks for watching. Bye.